A night on a planet is not supposed to last forever. Even as I travel the entire planet, east to west and north to south, all I see are stars against the black sky. Lots of them. The celestial sphere still seems to rotate around once every 24 hours. As the years and years go by, some of the stars get brighter, while others simply disappear. They rise in the east and set in the west. All except for one. Soul, the star we call the sun. The Earth is moving through space, but we're trapped. Trapped in orbit around a massive object. But lucky for us, that massive object happens to be a thermonuclear furnace from which we get most of our energy. That massive object is the Sun, of course. But what would happen to Earth if the Sun wasn't there anymore? Before we answer that, let's first talk about how this would happen. The initial speed and position of the Earth when it was first formed relative to the Sun determines its orbit. This relationship is determined by the law of gravity. To simplify, things with mass attract other things with mass. The bigger the mass, the bigger the attraction, and the harder it is for such mass to move. The Sun is 333,000 times more massive than the Earth. So, you can see why the Earth goes around the Sun, contrary to ancient beliefs. Now, the Earth along with the other seven planets have been going around the Sun in stable orbits for at least 4.5 billion years. The orbits are far enough from each other that they don't pull on each other because of gravity. And this is good. I mean real good. But what would happen if something really massive like a star or black hole passes really close to the solar system? The one thing that will happen for sure is that the orbits of all planets will be changed. Even if this is a relatively quick event and it results in no intersecting orbits, the damage may have already been done. While the new orbits don't overlap, it may bring the planets close enough to each other as they orbit the sun that they start to affect each other's orbit. And each time this happens, their orbits are further changed. Until they come so close that they either crash into each other, or they come so close but miss that the less massive planet is slingshot with enough speed to escape the gravity of the sun and become an interstellar planet. Or, as sensationalists would like to call it, a rogue planet. So now that we've been ejected from the solar system, what happens next? Let's take a little step back and look at what happened to the Earth during the ejection. As we accelerate towards the other planet, its gravitational field will start to affect the Earth more and more. And since we're dealing with a planet that's large enough to eject us out of the solar system, it must have a strong gravitational field, which means it's massive. With a field that's strong, the side of the Earth closest to the planet will experience stronger pull than the side furthest away. As a result of this, the Earth will start to stretch slightly. But because of the mass of the Earth, this slight stretching will result in an enormous amount of mass being moved and lots of energy being released. This then results in earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, gigantic tides, and tsunamis. A similar effect is happening on Io, Jupiter's closest moon. Since Io has an elliptical orbit, as it gets closer to Jupiter, it stretches, and as it moves away, it contracts, causing serious volcanic activity. Just look at the volcano. By the way, the plumes is about 200 kilometers high. But anyway, back to Earth. After the acceleration stops, and Earth is on its way out of the solar system, there will be tons of volcanic ash in the air. Light from the sun would partially be blocked, and global temperature would drop. This is something we've got to get used to in the near future anyway, since we'll be receiving less light from our sun as we move away from it. As time goes by, our farms will yield less food each year, until they can no longer depend on the sun for energy. Not enough light and not enough heat. Sure, it's getting darker each day and the sky is starting to look dark blue, but we've got artificial lighting, so we'll be fine for now. Farming will be done indoors where we control the light and the temperature. But outside, the temperature will continue to drop. And when it drops below minus 78.5 Celsius, 
carbon dioxide will start to freeze out of the atmosphere, followed by nitrogen starting at minus 210 Celsius, and finally, oxygen at minus 219 Celsius. There goes our entire atmosphere, frozen solid and about 100 meters thick. Earth is now an interstellar planet, joining the billions of other interstellar planets that's expected to exist in the Milky Way. It's hard to get a good figure on this though, because planets don't emit visible light, and since they're interstellar planets, don't expect them to be hanging close to stars. Look closely in the void. Interstellar planets have one source of light, starlight. But contrary to the example given of Earth, the surface on an interstellar planet doesn't necessarily have to freeze over. First of all, some planets such as Earth, Venus, Mars have a liquid metal core. This is a huge source of heat and since it's surrounded by thousands of kilometers of rocks, this heat can take a long time to leak out. So while the surface may be 40 degrees Celsius above absolute zero, the core will still be thousands of degrees Celsius. Now, if that planet has some sort of liquid ocean, and in that ocean it has enough hydrothermal vents to heat it up, then the ocean will remain liquid and transfer that heat to the surface. This will then prevent the atmosphere from freezing. Of course, this will also cause the planet to lose heat a lot faster. However, when you have hundreds of millions of years of heat stored in your core, I guarantee you, you won't be losing any sleep over the loss of a few million years of heat because of hydrothermal vents. So, it is possible that interstellar Earth and other interstellar planets may not freeze after all, but retain a surface temperature high enough that liquids such as water can exist. So it's not all doom and gloom. There could be thousands of interstellar planets traveling between the stars and the Milky Way. As these planets pass through isolated environments such as stellar nurseries where new stars are born, and stellar graveyards filled with black holes, neutron stars, white dwarfs, remnants of stars long gone. Maybe, just maybe, by passing through these environments repeatedly, could be the environment needed to create the building blocks the catalyst molecules of life, not life itself. But once you drop that molecule into an ocean with the right ingredients at a comfortable room temperature, you may have just turned on the lights on that planet. It just takes a few billion years to be bright enough for you to notice. I'm DexDFX for the Celestial Sphere. <laughs>